running late for curfew? What are you doing? I'm making a late night sandwich like your grandma doesn't like me to. <laughs> your secret's safe with me. Mm -hmm. Same. So how was your party? Lame. I don't get what's so special about New Year's. Oh, what's special about New Year's? Yeah, I mean, you stay up late, everyone says, Happy New Year, and then a ball drops. Let me tell you something. I remember a year uh, you were just born. It was a very difficult year. You may not believe this, but there was no toilet paper to be found anywhere. Gross. Well, that wasn't even the half of it. People couldn't shake hands, they couldn't hug. You didn't want to leave your house or you're afraid you might get sick. And masks, everyone was wearing masks everywhere. You couldn't tell if somebody was smiling or frowning. That sounds weird. You, you couldn't go visit with family, not even at the, the holidays, you know? Then what happened? Well, that's the best part. Then God got us through it, just like he always does. That's why I like new. See, God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. New, my dear, gives us a, a different perspective on things. Like on toilet paper, I guess. <laughs> I mean, just because it's new doesn't mean it's going to be good. You're right. You're right. That is why we hold on to the words of Jesus, who said, uh, in this world you will have troubles. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That boop is why we celebrate now. Hey, Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Do you want to hate him turkey? Good morning. Well, that was very enlightening. So let's go to prayer as we have that in our thoughts. Lord God, we just thank you for this new year. Whether it be a good new year or a so-so new year or whatever it brings, Lord, it is new. And we serve the overcomer. And so, Lord, with that in mind, that's what gives us our hope to move forward, to look forward to good things because we have you in our lives, Lord. So we just, um, <clears throat> we just invite your presence to be among us this morning. Lord, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and we just give you this day and we love you so much in your name, amen. Do we have Bonnie? Oh, right here, oh, here we go. That's the, here you go. Oh, I didn't know. I was doing it now or not. a throne in heaven to come to Bethlehem and I will not forget the way he loved me even then and and everywhere he traveled, he spoke with words of love that said he'd go to any distance to see what I was worthy of. And when at 
last that dusty road turned to Calvary he picked up a rock and burden so that someday I would see I knew that some 
Thank you, Bonnie. That was beautiful. Well, my daughter finally got us sick. She had a bug for about two days, and then we had it for three days. But she enjoyed Christmas very much. So thank you for calling. Thank you for your prayers. It's always, it's always good to be called from the congregation. Are you OK? Yes, we are OK, especially during this time. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, tithes and offerings. We have a collection box sitting outside the main doors if you would like to give by check or cash. Or you can give online at fourthplainnaz.com. And alabaster boxes are outside in the foyer, um, also outside by the collection box, if you'd like to, or uh, if you want to take one for the February alabaster offering. These are our COVID guidelines. Um, anyone on church grounds, inside or out, we just ask that you please wear a mask. Um, we ask that you social distance six feet apart. We have these nice little planks in the pews that you can hit your neighbor with if they're falling asleep. Um, keep your hands away from your face, just good to do that. Um, wash your hands often with soap and water. Uh, cover your coughs and sneezes with, uh, with tissues. Please don't sneeze into your mask like I've done way too many times. Um, clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. And if you are high risk, we just ask that uh, you stay home, listen to the service from your car. Um, and if you feel sick, uh, seek medical care as needed. And if you attend the service outside in your car, please use the restrooms in the Ed Wing. And if you use the bathroom, just please use the sanitary wipes to wipe the counters down. For Christmas, my father-in-law got me a book on how to beat the coronavirus. And I really appreciated it because a lot of this now is just don't do this, don't do that, run away. Well, that gets old after a while. But this book actually had some pretty good advice. Um, there's foods you can eat to actually help build your immune, immune system, like red bell peppers and strawberries. And also, just remember to get some good sleep. Go to bed early. <laughs> it's good for you, and it'll help you fight tomorrow. Um, our regular Wednesday activities are open at 6.30, and we are changing our food drive hours. Instead of every Thursday, we're going to have it every other Monday, so starting tomorrow. Nope, not starting tomorrow. He's second, second and the fourth Monday. And if we have a fifth Monday in the month, which is March and May, then that's just going to be a day off. So starting next week, we'll have uh, the food drive every other Monday. The second and fourth. Second and fourth Monday, <laughs> right. We have another video for you. Go ahead and watch this. Are you showing that on Wednesday? Yes. Okay. <laughs> cool. If you want to see that, uh, that's a um, all in church movie, uh, everyone. 6.30. 630. It's going to take two hours, so it's going to start right at 6.30. Oh, boy. It's going to take two hours, so start right at 6.30. Go to 8.30. Looks like a good movie, though. One more announcement before we pray. We're having another one. Me and Ashley. <laughs> church growth. And technically, yes, we are having another one because you're all part of our church. Everyone was like, who's we? All of us? Or no? No, just me and Ashley. We don't know the gender yet because we are... We had to do a blood test to find it, and then they said, you'll find out within two to three weeks instead of two to three days, so dang. <laughs> but the baby is active and healthy, and uh, so, yes, we're excited. Uh, do July um, 9th, yes. Wow, you can share birthday weeks then. Oh, well, <laughs> almost made it. <laughs> Baby has standards now already. For our prayer, I'd like to open with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this new year. Lord, we had quite a year full of many uncertainties and bumps in the road. And Lord, it was hard. We lost people very unexpectedly. But Father, Ephesians 1 says you work all things by the counsel of your will and that you work all things for good for those who are called according to your purpose and those who love you. And Lord, it's hard. It's almost as if we're still waiting and still wondering. But Lord, let this promise be certain in our hearts. If we are in Christ, we are new creations. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. It's not as if we are just declared forgiven. Lord, we are actually made righteous. We are actually right with you because you have forgiven us. Lord, let that promise rest on us. We love you, Lord. Because you have loved us, we actually love you. In your name, amen. So the scripture that you read has to go, goes along with what I have to say this morning. So <clears throat> if you think of a mirror, what is the purpose of a mirror? Reflect. To reflect something. So imagine um, before mirrors existed, probably people would want to see their reflection maybe know what they want to look like or what they did look like. Maybe they went to a, a lake or a pond or some kind of watery surface that they could see their reflection. But would that accurately give them an accurate reflection of what they looked like? Not really, because it would be somewhat distorted in some ways. Well, then eventually uh, mirrors were invented, and so especially the flatter the mirror, the more pure and accurate the reflection. And so we look into mirrors to get a reflection of what is being shown. Well, we, we as Christians have a job to be accurate reflections, but not of ourselves, but of Christ, correct? So we need to make sure that the reflection that we are reflecting of Christ is as accurate and pure as we can versus the kind of reflection that we can give out as if someone was looking seeing Christ through us as if looking at a murky pond water. We wouldn't be accurately reflecting Christ. And sometimes, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, myself as well, I think we reflect the, the, the murky water reflection more than the perfect mirror reflection. I think sometimes we distort how we are supposed to be reflecting Christ to others. And I think along with the theme of the new year, and along with the scripture that John wrote, um, becoming a new creation, do we want that new creation to reflect an inaccurate portrait of Christ or an accurate portrait of Christ. But what if I was standing here with a mirror, but I also had a clear bowl of water and some pebbles? Because here's why we need to have an accurate reflection of Christ in our lives. If it just affected me, 
great, no problem. I have to answer for myself and my, my activity and my responsibility. But we can't forget that when we are reflecting Christ through ourselves, it doesn't just affect us. It's like dropping that pebble into the water and seeing the ripples move out across the water. Every decision that I make is dropping a pebble in the water. And every reaction from those pebble or from the ripples moving out, those ripples are affecting the people in my life and they're affecting the people that are around me. So my actions and my choices don't just affect myself. They affect those within the realm of my, as far as my ripples reach out. Does that make sense? So if I'm affecting others with the way I live my life, I want my life to be re an accurate reflection of Christ and not an inaccurate, warped, warbled reflection of Christ. Because I don't want the responsibility of someone within the realm of my ripples to not choose Christ because of the reflection they see in me. Well, if that's the way he is, I don't want anything to do with it. I want my reflection to be so accurate, not by my own strength, but through the strength of the Holy Spirit within me, to be so accurate that it would not only bring someone to say, hey, what's different about that person? I want that. But that it would draw the attention of many to ask the question, why do you make those decisions the way you do? If, I, if it was me, I would, ah. Oh. But it's not about me anymore. It's about the Christ that I serve and the Christ that I want to portray to you. Let me tell you about him. So when you look inside the mirror and you, when you see little rocks along the waterway, think, do I want my reflection to be accurate? Does my opinion of which reflection I prefer, does it affect me or does it affect anyone else around me? It affects everyone around you, people you know and people you don't know. So think about that next time you're looking at yourself in the mirror. Man. Man. Way to go. Aren't you glad that we have a family uh, service? Three of you are. Way to go on church growth, dude. <laughs> Keep it up. 2020 wasn't so bad when you have this kind of audience for your sermons. That's uh, number 10. He, uh, according to his parents, every time they showed the, uh, my sermons, he wasn't like Rod who would sleep through it. He would watch, anticipate, happy. Uh, we are, uh, this is a, a special Sunday. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, we were engaged for about six months. And then uh, January, the first Sunday in January was uh, our marriage. Did you know that? Happy anniversary. Three of you are really excited about that. We had the DS here, installation, and um, we had some exciting times. Yeah. Leftovers. Savior.
sound of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine only know. Jesus paid it all. All to him I know. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
Sometimes I think we are like uh, Samuel's or uh, uh, Saul's daughter who married David, and uh, she is standing up or sitting at uh, at the window watching David dance and get all excited about the Lord. And what does she do? She grumbles. That's not how a, a king should act. And I hope that that's not what we uh, are feeling. And I'm not going to tell if somebody uh, sang along. And I don't want you telling on, on another neighbor in case that happens. Leftovers. I don't know about you, but at uh, Thanksgiving and on, um, well, Easter, but also on Christmas Day, I look at the table, I look around at uh, how many are sitting around, I kind of figure out um, how much each one should be eating, and then I am already calculating what will be left over. Anybody with me? and pie. I want to know, will I have another piece of pie? Because I, I, I like that. I, I'm already thinking about leftovers. I'm already thinking about that hot turkey sandwich. Even though I'm sitting at a table, gorging myself, I'm thinking about my leftover hot, I'm going to get you hungry, hot turkey sandwich. And all oh, the ham sandwiches that come out, oh, the, the special mustard and everything that goes on that. Yes, I am thinking about leftovers. Leftovers are great. Have you, um, do you know if somebody were to say what the Great Commission is? You know what, uh, where that's found and Pastor Paula? To pastor ordination, did you have to know what the Great Commission was? Yeah, well, okay, here we go. I'm, I'm going to read it, but this is uh, actually the modern church has made it the Great Omission. The Great Omission. See if you can pick up on what is missing. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll tell you later what the great omission is. But I told you that I like leftovers, and so I am going to uh, give you some leftovers. Um. This is our first anniversary, and three clapped. Oh, yeah. I feel, I feel the warmth right there. Just a minute. I'm having a moment. I hear the honks. So if you can remember, I ask, uh, well, I'm going to wait on that. What is the great omission? Did anyone pick up when I read that, that there's a great omission that the modern day church has? What was missing out of there? Jesus said, teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. Many years ago, I read a book on discipleship. I cannot find it in my library anymore. I read it in the 80s, 
but it still stuck with me. He was uh, from South America. He, uh, his text was Ephesians chapter 4. If you would see my Bible on my desk that I uh, mark up, you would see I, I even wrote excellent chapter. I just, I just love uh, Ephesians 4. So he uh, reads part of Ephesians 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The pastor went on to tell about how everyone has a spiritual gift. In verse 7, it talks about how Paul says everyone has a spiritual gift. And we talked about the difference between a gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is not going to save anyone. There will be in the last days those who will say, I have performed all kinds of miracles in your name. I've healed people. I've cast out demons. And Jesus will still say to them, what? I never knew you. I gave you that gift. Why are you so proud of it? But the fruit of the Spirit is that which every Christian ought to have in him or her. And so gifts are not a guarantee that anyone is saved. So then he goes on in verse 13. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming, but speak the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. After he got done preaching on Ephesians 4, he stopped with a great crescendo, and the people stood and applauded him. This actually would happen in, in prison. Different cultures are different. White people stay seated. I've noticed that. But for over 28 years, I was preaching to a multicultural uh, congregation. And when their chaplain got done preaching, they would stand up and give him a standing ovation. And I never knew until later that they were clapping because I finally finished. But... Uh, so this, uh, this uh, South American pastor, his, his congregation stands up, gives him a great uh, applause and claps him on the back as he goes out. A great sermon, pastor. You really nailed it. That was just wonderful. I loved it. Next Sunday, they, uh, they, they, they file in to the service, all excited uh, to hear what the pastor has to say, and he says, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And he preaches them the exact same sermon. People are a little confused. They still kind of stand up and give them applause. That was, that was a great sermon. Maybe he didn't have time to uh, come up with anything new. So uh, we'll just applaud and let him, let him go. They file out. Way to go, Pastor. That was nice. Next Sunday they come in. They file in. They are ready for uh, his, his next sermon. They, 
And the pastor gets his Bible out, and where does he turn to? Ephesians chapter 4, and preaches them the exact same sermon. People are a little confused, even more confused the third time hearing the same sermon yet again. And finally they uh, turn to the deacons and they say, hey, can you go talk with the pastor? There's something wrong with him. And so the deacon comes and asks him, uh, why are you preaching the same sermon?" And the pastor says back to him, do you believe that everyone loves each other with all humility and gentleness with patience? No, not everyone. Do you believe that there is unity of the spirit that we are told to diligently preserve? No, I can say that 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 is not happening, especially since you've preached the same sermon three times. What about doctrine? Do all the people understand the truth of the gospel? And does each person in our church have a personal relationship with Christ? No, not, not everyone. When you know that a brother or sister are living in open sin, do you go and speak to them uh, the truth in love? Do you or others do that now? Well, no, I didn't think it was our business. I thought you would take care of that. Is everyone growing in all aspects of being true disciples of Christ? Discouraged by now, he remains silent. Then I will continue to preach the same sermon until everyone, gets to a point where they are mature people to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. I'm telling you, that's radical. That's radical. What happens today is we have, uh, that, that was written clear back in the 80s, it has only gotten I don't want to say worse, it's only expanded. I mean, how much knowledge and new knowledge can we have and how many Bible studies and sermons and, and especially during this COVID. People watching sermons in diapers. And that's okay. Some uh, have watched many televangelists, have no idea what their doctrine is, and, and, and still are watching it. Some are actually watching on YouTube. All three of them have watched on YouTube and, and saw some of uh, my sermons. Oh, that was good. That was very special. That was special. What's for dinner? So we have filled ourselves up with all kinds of knowledge. We know things. But are we disciples of Christ? His concern is, is my concern. Jesus said, make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Not just teaching, but teaching them to obey. The problem is, our goal is uh, not to see how many converts we can have. Uh, The... 
mega churches have found that they have a mile wide and an inch deep. There's nothing there. The pastor leaves and the whole congregation leaves. Our goal is not to just have converts. We're here to make disciples. Disciples. I asked at a uh, Christmas service, you might remember, maybe you don't even remember that one, I don't know. The Christmas service, I said, hey, turn to the next person and say, and ask them, uh, what were three gifts that you were given this pa- or last year? Not 2020, that would be 2019. We all struggled at that. Well, I've preached over, uh, I've preached a lot. Turn to your neighbor and tell them three of my sermons that I've preached to you. A uh, Sunday school teacher said, ah, preaching. Who needs it? What we need is just where we gather together and we talk. We just talk. We talk. He was a Sunday school teacher and proud of his class. And he came and he said uh, the same kind of uh, thing. Uh, You've been preached to 52 times. Give me one sermon that you can remember. No one could. And he's pointing it right at me and, and saying, see... Preachers aren't really that necessary. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Can you name off the seven meals that you've had this past week? But they were pretty needed at that time, weren't they? Your stomach was empty and you needed something to fill it, right? Okay, I get it. So I've decided on this anniversary to give you some leftovers. And I would hope that in this next year, I think that we're good at uh, telling other people what they're good at, but we're not good at saying what we're good at. Have you noticed that? I did that with the, uh, the board. I said, Paul said, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Tell me, what would you want somebody to imitate you? Oh, I could tell you what they shouldn't imitate. I would hope in this next year that you will discover what you're good at, and actually put it to use. God does not want to use you. God wants you to be useful. Useful. I know that my spiritual gift is teaching. I love to teach. My wife reminds me of that many times. Oh, this is your teacher voice. Yes, it is. So I will use this to teach. And hopefully you will take the teaching and make it into discipleship. Draw closer to Christ. My main course comes from what is good. Good for goodness sakes. That's what... uh, the world sings about. Sometimes it makes it into the church. Good for goodness sakes. Just be good for goodness sakes. But the atheists have society actually put it on buses that said, why do you need God? Just be good for goodness sakes. 
You see, do we have the same kind of zealousness for good as Peter said? Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Is it possible for the world to just be good for goodness sakes? Click, click. The atheists uh, said uh, people should skip church. That, that was a wasted sign. People skip church all the time. I mean, why pay to put it on uh, billboards? Just skip church. Good is a dangerous in the hands of the world. Goodness becomes a relative term. It's whatever cause that uh, they want to uh, say we need to do because it is good. Hitler said killing the Jews was good for mankind. You see, without God, good becomes a wild card. Sweetheart, you can't go? It won't go? Keep trying. There we go. As we continue to eat the leftovers, I want you to look at one central point about zealousness for what is good. And that is to have a good conscience. It says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience. So in the things that you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. I think it's on purpose, the idea of good conscience. In my prison ministry, I, I told you this illustration. You will always remember illustrations even if you don't remember the sermon. So... In uh, prison ministry, I met uh, a, a, man, a guy by the name of Tim. He said that he had, click, there you go. Uh, met a guy by the name of Tim, said that he uh, had robbed 50 banks, made a deal with the feds, and they grouped them all together, and gave him his time. But he wasn't sorry. He went to a victim impact panel. Uh, tellers came in and told their story about how they had lost their marriages, lost their jobs, lost, uh, had nightmares, couldn't go out in public. Their biggest fear was that they would go out in public and they would see the guy that put the gun in their face. Ruined their lives. Tim was unmoved by the stories. I called him in my office and I started talking to him and he said, the tellers know what, their, uh, what kind of job it is. It's not their money. Just hand it over. Besides, he always said, please and thank you. He was labeled the gentleman's bank robber. I didn't tell Tim at the time that my wife was a bank teller. And that's not good, Tim. Tim. 
what you're doing. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This commandment I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. You see, Paul places an emphasis to Timothy, his disciple, keep the faith and keep a good conscience. Once again, the idea of good. You see, Tim could sit in my office and say, Chaplain, I was a gentleman. I said please and thank you as they gave me the money. I have a clear conscience. People are able to fool their conscience at all times. They can compartmentalize things. They can say, well, this is my church time. I will be good during that time. Well, mostly good. I will try to stay awake during this time, but then I'll go back to my other time. I've compartmentalized it. I have a clear conscience. I went to church. Check that one off. Paul put a great emphasis on keeping a good conscience. He says that there are some who shipwreck their faith. And I'm sure if we had had them in our congregation today, they would say, oh, I have a clear conscience. I have a clear conscience. Running off with that secretary, doing a, do all those drugs and, 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 and jumping on the pornography sites and all that. Oh, I have a clear conscience. Shipwrecked their faith. They didn't have a good conscience. A good conscience would say, this is not good. Well, let me finish up the main course and we'll get on with the dessert. <laughs> Pie. Uh, there was a scientist who, who said that I, uh, I figured out how to make man. Yep. I can do it, God. You and me. Let's have a contest. I think I can make a, I, I figured it all out. And so, God says, all right, I'll take you on. And the scientist bends down, and I'd bend down except my knee. They bend down and grab some dirt, and God says, oh, no, 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 no. Go get your own dirt. You see, the world thinks that they have the word good figured out. And God says, no. Jesus himself said, only God is good. That's God's word. He decides what is good. Well, let's get on to the dessert. It comes from humble pie. Humble pie. First Peter chapter 5. You younger men. I sure appreciate you putting this water up here. That means I can preach another two hours. That's great. You all right so far? You're hanging in there pretty well. You know that the softs went through being exposed to uh, COVID, right? And uh, what I heard was 
Rod was cleared, and uh, he was able to come into the house. I don't know if the family celebrated at that point, or I haven't heard from them yet. Dessert. First Peter chapter 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Peter ate a lot of humble pie in his day. Sticking his foot in, saying the wrong thing, bragging beyond his means. Humble pie means that we just embarrass ourselves because somebody points out, that's not true. That's not right. <laughs> Humble pie, embarrassed. Better said, humiliated. Peter went through a lot of that. And yet now he tells in his letters that we ought to clothe ourselves with humility. I have found that um, you, know how, you know how preachers will say, don't pray for pre patience, right? Why don't you pray for patience? Because then you'll always have trouble, right? Because trouble is a thing that causes you to have, you're supposed to have patience after all that trouble comes. I, this, this idea of humility, I think that uh, humility comes to us. Peter says, clothe ourselves. I think it's getting ready. But humility comes in many forms and fashions. Poverty humbles us. Many have lost their jobs, and they are humbled by coming and getting food. And I've told many of them, please, please, I don't want you to feel humiliated, or I want you to know that God loves you. Just accept it as God's love for you. Colfax, we were pastoring. It was unfair, but I said to my wife, where would Jesus be? Would he be in the prisons or would he be in a local church? It was unfair. We ended up moving from that church to volunteer prison ministry. And I was working odd and end jobs with my brother, trying to make ends meet with three kids and a wife that... All four of them like to eat. I don't know why, but they just like to eat. Scrambling around trying to find odd and end jobs to, to feed my family and then go into the prisons and, and minister. One day we came home. And there was a basket. It had a turkey in it. And we had food that day. That was humbling. Rent was coming due. We didn't know what we were going to do. A guy met us out in the parking lot and says, don't make this a big deal. And handed us an envelope. You can do this if you want, but hand us an envelope and it had $500 in it. $500. You just paid our rent. Cl 
clothe yourself with humility. Well, sometimes poverty causes us to be humbled. Other times, events cause us to be humbled. Do you remember this story? Andrew Enskeep was taking his junior high or middle high by the uh, Hood River. And they were out in the river and all of a sudden a bank that they were standing on was washed away. Andrew went after a teen and, and brought him back and there was another 11 year old that was still out there. And he turned around and he went back for him and both of them ended up drowning. Events humble us. This virus I tell you, I'm, I'm humbled every time I have to put on that mask and go into that, into Safeway. <clears throat> That's the only place I'll go. No. I'll go to Starbucks. It's humbling. Some people will refuse to do it. Right, Bill? But you know something? Bill's sitting right back there with a mask on. Would he rather not have a mask on? He wants to be a preacher, so he doesn't have to wear a mask. Events humble us. People humble us. Man. Peter didn't like it when Jesus got down as a servant and started to wash his feet. Never will you do that. No, no, get away from me. Come on, stand up, be a man. That's not what a rabbi does. Peter, if I don't do this to you, you will have no part of me. Okay, then give me a sponge bath. And Jesus says, no, that's not what's needed. But I've given you an example that you should follow. You know, there's nothing worse than a good example to humble you. This Pastor Mario, I don't know how he has enough energy to load up that truck, bring it over here, unload that truck of food, stand out and greet all those people, and he had been doing it twice a week. Good examples. They humble us. You know, another thing that humbles us is depression. One of the things that the Bible does not say is depression is a sin. One of the things we find in the Psalms is David was depressed a lot. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Do you know who said that? You would say Jesus. I would say David. Said it before him. Elijah, after all the, the victories he had on the mountaintop, 
came running down, and one woman said, I will get you, Elijah, like you got all my prophets. And Elijah believed her and ran out into the desert and said, Take my life. I am no better than my father. Depression humbles us. Sometimes it can be because of somebody has passed away. And sometimes it can be cumulative, like, are you kidding? This has been since March? And it may not be over until next summer? We thought it was only going to be a week or two. So cumulative can humble us. So what can we learn during this time? You see, that's what David did. If you read the rest of that psalm, Psalm 22, he comes to a better conclusion. If you read about Elijah's life, he was influential on Elisha. There are many things that humble us. One of the uh, insights that I had reading an article on N.T. Wright was ignorance humbles us. Here this great uh, theologian is asked, So, why do you think that... Um, God put on the world this virus. Why, why do you think this is happening to us? What, what, is, what is the cause of all of this, this stuff, this bad stuff that's happening? And you know what he said in Time magazine? Christianity offers no answers about coronavirus. It's not supposed to. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't, I don't know. I like that. I thought Christians were supposed to know everything. I thought we were supposed to have answers for anything. And if we don't, we ask Pastor Grady. He'll tell us everything, even though he doesn't know anything. What he goes on to talk about is lamenting. Christians have forgotten how to mourn. So as we're fighting about whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, whether or not this is a hoax, whether or not the government is, is doing something very suspicious to us, people are dying. People are getting sick. We're still trying to figure out, well, give us an answer. Is it the government? Is it the, is it, is it, is it the Chinese? Is it, is it some, give us an answer. We want an answer because we're so proud. This is what I want you to do. Clothe yourself with humbleness. Weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. That was his point. Too many Christians are trying to say, God is in control. He does everything. What? He causes everything for his glory. He's just doing this. What? I used to be in a council for the uh, chaplaincy, and we would, we'd call in people like John, 
who wants to be a hospital chaplain. We'd say, John, come on in here. And after he had gone through uh, his ordination, after he got his MDiv, and after he'd done all his schooling, now it's our turn to talk to him about being a chaplain. And so one of the questions we would ask a hospital chaplain is, what would you do if you are called on and a mother has just had a stillborn baby? The best answer I heard was, I would just sit with them. I don't know the answer. But would you let me sit with you? Can I just be with you? Because I believe in a God who weeps. You see, Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb, and he began to weep. He lamented. Christians aren't supposed to know everything. If you've got to tell me that, that God is the one who cause that stillborn baby to die. That's not the God I serve. God didn't even want death. That was a choice, very poor choice. Two people who wanted to know as much as God ate of that tree. And death came on us. That's not God's idea. God is a God of the living. God is a God who weeps when stillborn babies. Clothe yourself in humility. I don't know, Lord. I don't know what the answer is. Will you be with us? Just sit with us. You don't have to answer any questions right now. Just love us. Clothe. In humility. Here's what's confusing. Now, that would be beautiful if I stopped the sermon right there. Would you feel okay if I did? The Thompson girls would. I know that. They keep track. They tell me, you know, you owe me 15 minutes of my life. I'll never get it back. I got to finish this up. You see, many times when we think, we think of, Humility, we think of Clark Kent. You know, the guy that sits in the corner, the guy that everybody ignores, the guy that, that, that you know, doesn't really have an opinion, is just there, but really not bugging anyone. Just, uh, just a quiet and reserved kind of, kind of guy. Sometimes we think that's what it means to clothe yourself in humility. <laughs> Jesus was able to function without knowing everything. Do you realize that? I, Jesus had real questions. Who touched me? When I come back, will, will there be anyone who will have faith in the Son of Man? He had real questions when they would ask him, um, tell me, um, tell me, uh, Jesus, uh, when will the Son of Man be coming down? I don't know. He could live in ignorance. He was okay of saying, I don't know. In the garden, he struggled. Couldn't figure out. Take this cup from me. Now, 
I'm going to take a turn. This is, this is where it gets real confusing. Um, this idea of being humble, we can see Clark Kent. I, I, I'll begin with this illustration. Paul says in Philippians 3, empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Remember what Paul had to say as we look at someone in our past generation who did not live up to the scriptures. Watch this. Then it became, look at me, draw attention to me. I remember when Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest. He didn't leave a legacy of boxing in the world. He left a legacy of ego in the world. That's like a byword for the culture. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest what? Why? He took a whole generation and moved them into the psychology of self-esteem. God hates pride. He hates haughty eyes. It destroys love. It destroys relationships, all of them. What is the killer of all relationships? Pride. Pride kills all relationships. It kills care. It kills sacrifice. It kills kindness. It kills the supreme virtue of all virtues, humility. Only humble people love. That's why Proverbs 8.13 says, pride and arrogance I hate, says the Lord. Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, then comes dishonor does the opposite. You notice that? When pride comes, then comes dishonor. Pride doesn't honor you, it dishonors you. Proverbs 13, 10 says, through pride comes strife, because it destroys relationships. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low. And then it says, honor belongs. To the humble. James and Peter both said in the New Testament, God exalts the humble and the basis the proud. Only humble people love. Only humble people build meaningful relationships. We have a, a total society consumed with people chasing their own personal exaltation and elevation. I told you, I'm the real champion. I told you, I'm the champion of the world. All of you bow. All of my critics. I am the greatest. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The hands can't hit what the eyes can't see. I am the greatest. It ain't bragging if you can back it up. He died at... 2016 of Parkinson's disease. He was hit more than anyone in the boxing history in the head. Divorced three times, slept with all kinds of women, suffered uh, drug addi addiction, read his book, and it was a very sad read how he ended up. You know, Jesus said some pretty uh, amazing things about himself. It ain't bragging if you can back it up. Paul said, empty conceit. I think uh, Jesus didn't remain Clark Kent all the time. But it is interesting that Jesus said of himself, I am humble, and I have a gentle soul. Normally, if a person says, I am humble, you would say, no, you're not, because you're bragging. C.S. Lewis said, Christ says that he is a humble and meek, and we believe him, not noticing that if, he were merely a man, humility and meekness are the very last characteristics we would attribute to some of his sayings. 
The storm was too strong. Fishermen, who should know better than a carpenter, come down to the carpenter and get upset at him. Jesus stood up and the sea sat down and they said, who is this guy? Who can control nature but God himself? When the disciples said, uh, we can't feed this multitude, all we have are these two loaves and five fish. We could not feed these 5,000 people. Jesus said, hand it to me. And there were basketfuls left over. Who does that? The woman at the well said, I know the messenger is coming. Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. The, more, the man born, uh, born blind, he uh, uh, was, was cured and, and meets up with Jesus once again. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Jesus asked him, and who is he? He asked, Lord, that I may believe in him. He is the one who is talking with you. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth out of the grave after laying there for four days. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, pick up your bed and walk. I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. No one comes to the Father but through me. Click. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. God said to Moses, tell them, I am who I am. The phrase I am was so sacred that they could not use the same pen to continue on in their writing. They would throw that pen away and get a new pen just to keep going. And they could never enter the vowels into the word. I am, Jesus declares, while John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, says, I am not. I am from above. I am not of this world. You will die in your sins unless you believe I am. For uh, you shall die in your sins. Before Abraham, I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the son of God. I am the resurrection and life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the vine. I am does not die. I am is eternal. For I am God himself. I am gentle. And humble in heart. I am who I am. Jesus. Jesus, oh Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Take a chance and sing with me. 
Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name let's pray Lord, you have asked us to be humble people. And we are humble in your presence. Our family have humbled us. Our schools have humbled us. Work has humbled us. The world has humbled us. But better said, they've humiliated. You have taught us what it means to be humble. We have Superman within us. Lord, teach us to be humble. In thy precious name, in this brand new year, amen. Amen. I owe the Thompson girls 25 minutes. God love you. If you're still awake, you may be dismissed. See you.